Okay, so our first morning session uh, is titled The Science of CRISPR, and this will feature a few talks on the basic biology of CRISPR systems as well as DNA double-strand break repair. And kicking it off uh, is Alan Davidson from the University of Toronto in the land of hockey. And so Alan's lab uh, investigates a number of topics, including protein-protein interactions and basic phage biology. Um, but recently, he's been busy characterizing anti-CRISPR systems and some of the ways that phage can defend uh, against our favorite genome editing tools. Hi, I'd uh, really like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's always nice to come back to Boston where I lived for a few years, a long time ago now. Um, this is, this slide's just to remind you, I, we do come from Canada and we do spend most of our time on the rink, so the, the science is, uh, we squeeze in when we're not playing hockey and that's just my son not celebrating goal, but celebrating victory over CRISPR-Cas systems, which I'll <laughs> be talking about today. So. Um, Eugene just introduced you very nicely to all the different uh, CRISPR systems, and as, uh, as I can go forward, as you all know, CRISPR systems did not come into existence to help us edit our genomes. They uh, originally have been out there, we presume, to do, do something to mobile DNA and presumably protect cells against uh, viruses. And, um, it's well known that bacteria have evolved many different methods to protect themselves against viruses. Viruses are everywhere in the world. They're uh, phages that infect bacteria, the most uh, common organic entities on Earth. Wherever there's bacteria, there's viruses trying to kill them. And um, this is just a, a diagram of the many different systems that uh, bacteria have evolved to protect themselves against viruses. We mentioned restriction enzymes, there's ways of blocking receptors, and of course, the CRISPR system is probably the most fascinating and useful method that's come up. But um, uh, viruses and bacteria are in what we call an evolutionary arms race. Uh, the phages don't take this, uh, these defenses sitting down. What I'm gonna tell you today is about how phages have fought back against CRISPR systems and uh, develop proteins to stop CRISPR systems. I, I, I'm going to tell the story in kind of a historical way because we discovered these in our lab a number of years ago and it, it's interesting to reflect how we found these things without really trying originally. So um, I'm just going to introduce the system that we were working on at the time. And um, this is a CRISPR-Cas system in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And this is not a Cas9 system. It's not a genome editing system. This is a type 1F system, which has multiple subunits. Um, but at the time, this was one of the first systems that was actually looked into, both structurally and uh, in vivo. And the vexing, confusing results early on in the study of this system was that it actually didn't seem to work against phages. And uh, it was first worked on in George O'Toole's lab at, at Dartmouth. And what they found was some very weird behaviors of um, cooperation between a bacteriophage genome inside the bacteria, which is called a prophage. So bacteriophages integrate into bacteria and form prophages. They found that a certain prophage caused um, reduction of biofilm and that this uh, phenomenon was uh, required the CRISPR system, so it was very mysterious. So they started studying the CRISPR system, and their, one of their significant findings was, in fact, that the CRISPR system didn't seem to work. They were infecting s these cells, uh, this strain called PA14, with phages that should have been targeted because they had perfect matches to spacers, and it, the phages grow, grew perfectly well. So the conclusion at the, around 2011 was that the system was there and it seemed to make CRISPR RNAs and CRISPR Cas complexes, but they couldn't do anything to phages and it wasn't understood why. Um, around this time, we started working on Pierre Genosa and my lab for a totally different uh, reason. We were interested in, in some other things that I won't even go into, but as part of the process of, of studying this organism, which we had never studied before, we acquired a very large group of strains, 88 strains, 
And we realized as we were studying them, um, and it kind of messed up what we were trying to do, that most of, the, most of these strains actually had prophages in them, and they were actively producing phages all the time. And so since the phages were there, instead of crying about it, because they were preventing us from doing other experiments, I told my student, Joe Bondi Denemy, to just study these phages and see what they are and, and see what they're doing. So he just started, we really didn't have a plan for this, but he started very diligently uh, isolating phages from these strains. And it, it was a lot of uh, very careful and painstaking work. And he eventually found that 66% of these strains produced phages. And um, some of them could infect the strain PA14 that was commonly used, and, and some couldn't. But he ultimately produced a very large collection of phages. And this is really what allowed us to do everything after this, uh, his work with, with these phages. And um, one of the things um, we did after a while was uh, acquire um, the CRISPR deleted strain from George O'Toole's lab, because we were interested if there were any phages that could actually be resisted by this CRISPR system now that we had a large collection. And the exciting uh, first result that uh, Joe produced is that actually there were phages that were targeted by this CRISPR-Cas system. It was not a dead system. And this is, uh, you were introduced to this concept yesterday, but these are phage plaques. And this is what phages can really do to bacteria. These are dilutions of a lysate of phage. And when you drop, a, put a drop of them onto a bacterial lawn, which is the gray in the background, you get these big zones of clearing. And what this is showing you here is that this system is actually very potent. If there's no CRISPR-Cas system, all three of these phages can plate very well. And these are tenfold dilutions. But when you're on the wild type strain of the CRISPR system, the reduction in and phage uh, plating is a, about a million fold. So this CRISPR-Cas system really blocks these phages. So the system really worked. So that um, then brought us to a paradox of why it didn't work for all phages. And the first thing we did was actually sequence these phages on which the system did work. And everything looked very normal with this CRISPR system. It had two CRISPR arrays, had normal looking Cas genes. And we could identify spacers within these arrays that match these phages perfectly. And, and that was clear uh, that that's why the system worked. It was fine. But then we uh, had a paradox with these other phages we were working with. In the, and, and these phages also that they had worked with in the O'Toole lab, these phages had, um, as denoted by these colors, they had perfectly good spacers. Uh, protospacers that match spacers within the CRISPR array. So by all measures, these phages also should have been targeted by this CRISPR system, but they were, were not. They were plating perfectly well. So we started to think that maybe there was something in these phages that was allowing them to evade the CRISPR-Cas system. And that's where uh, things got very interesting and through some first functional assays on some of these phages and then staring at their genomes a little bit and comparing the genomes of phages that resisted the CRISPR system to those that didn't, we realized that there are some extra genes in uh, a, many of these phages that weren't in a phage that was targeted by the CRISPR system. We were very lucky, as it turned out, that all these phages ended up looking very much like each other. So this phage here that was targeted was missing this cluster of genes. And these phages that could evade the CRISPR system had these extra genes in them. So we immediately decided to see if these might actually be genes that could uh, do something to the CRISPR system. So Joe cloned these genes onto plasmids and expressed them in, uh, in cells that had a CRISPR system and uh, quickly realized that if we express these particular genes, they were shutting off the CRISPR-Cas system. So without a plasmid in them, the, the phage is inhibited. But expression of any of these uh, genes, which we started to call anti-CRISPRs, allowed the phages to grow. So it seemed clear that these genes were both necessary and sufficient to inhibit the CRISPR-Cas system. And these were the first, the, this was the first time 
anyone had seen uh, genes that could inhibit a, a CRISPR-Cas system. But in retrospect, it made a lot of sense that phages would want to do this. And it explained the previous observation that, of why these phages could grow on this strain that had a CRISPR system. They're making these genes that in, inhibit it. And we went on to show, in fact, that these, these genes could really allow the phage to grow. So this is really the example of the phage winning this evolutionary battle against the CRISPR system. This is a phage with an anti-CRISPR gene. And when we uh, disrupted that gene with a frame shift, the phage could no longer grow. And then we also took a phage that didn't have an anti-CRISPR gene against this system and added an anti-CRISPR gene, and the phage could now grow. So these single uh, genes could allow the, the phages to grow. And um, we realized then that this whole uh, <coughs> locus and these various phages, all these phages are very similar to each other. They had different genes in this region. And we realized that there were five distinct families of these anti-CRISPR genes that could all inhibit the 1F system of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The amazing thing is these genes are very small. They encode proteins usually of 100 residues or less. And yet they could very powerfully inhibit the CRISPR-Cas system. Uh, at this point, there were still a few genes that were not showing any uh, anti-CRISPR activity. We were wondering what they were, but we um, realized that uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa actually has two different types of CRISPR-Cas system. One is the 1F, which we've been working on. There's also a type 1E system. And we um, found a strain that had this system active. And we uh, were quickly able to discover, and this was a, a new student, April Pollock's work, that these genes that didn't have anti-1F activity had anti-1E activity. And so all the genes with check marks were anti-CRISPR genes, and we found five families of 1F anti-CRISPRs and four families of 1E anti-CRISPRs. And um, interestingly, they're, they're just uh, all found in the same region of these phages, but in different assortments, like someone just threw these genes into these genomes, and they landed there and, and did something useful, but um, in different ways, each phage grabbing from the bag of tricks that were out there. And uh, Eugene could maybe explain where these came from. We haven't figured it out yet. Uh, they don't look like uh, anything else uh, in genomes. So at this point now, we discovered nine families of anti-CRISPRs, but they were all in a, a, gr a closely related group of, of Pseudomonas phages and uh, didn't do anything against any other CRISPR systems outside of the Pseudomonas sy systems. So we were wondering then, can we find any other anti-CRISPRs in, in different organisms?